Once we do this analysis, we can then um, visualize where these transitions happen. So these are the vicariate events. So presumed, pre presumably previous um, uh, uniform distribution that um, was split apart by some geographic event. So here's the formation of the Tyrrhenian Sea, which was about 4 million years ago, and we've got our uh, vicariates around, at around 3.8 million years ago. So this, um, so our vicariates event fits well with the geology. And here's our dispersal events, so uh, with different time scales associated. So um, we've got our timeline, we've got 30 million years for our sickle and stem lineage and then the, the crown node when the uh, species started to diversify at about 12 million years. Okay, and then we can look at other um, um, vicariant events and try to tie those up with um, paleo paleogeography information. So the um, African groups diverged around 7 million years and that concurrent with the earliest evidence for the Sahara formation, which is a potential geographic barrier, say, between the Somalian species and the others. Uh, and here's the Tyrrhenian example that I just gave. So this uh, is a what's called a lineages through time plot. Okay? This is a representation of cyclamen diversity in terms of number of lineages through time. So here's the number of lineages. Um, so here's uh, our 25 species, okay, uh, or 24 just before the present day, okay. Here's our timeline. This is the present. This is 14 million years ago, okay. We've got two lines here showing confidence intervals for our dating. Uh, and what we can see when we plot these things is if we've got a uh, rapid um, uh, ra rapid diversification that's um, tied to some temporal event, we should see a sort of uptick pattern as we go steady state, steady state. Some geographic event happens and then we get a sort of massive spike in diversity. But actually what we see for cyclamen is a steady state diversification. Here's the, the simian salinity crisis when a lot of the um, Mediterranean Sea um, basically um, went. And here's the formation of the Sahara. Okay? But we don't really see a big uptick in uh, diversification that's concurrent with any of these events. It's just a you know, one or two, but not a real massive diversification. So this is a steady state diversification with individual nodes the little arrow signify a, a, a vicarious event. So no one big event that produced massive diversity, but lots of small localised events. Okay. So as I said, the, the, the deeper or um, more recently Lagrange um, style um, ancestral area reconstruction has this, um, has this artifact of the methodology where the, the basal ancestral areas always come out as um, basically everywhere you've ever seen your organism. Okay, but why don't we look at using uh, niche models to, to reconstruct an ancestral area to see if we can get a, uh, a more refined picture. So uh, again, so we, we constructed niche models for cyclamen species. Here's uh, precipitation in the warmest month. So um, you get these met true Mediterraneans where you've got um, very little rainfall and uh, they're really specialized for that climate. And then you've got a few really broad, um, uh, with really broad environmental tolerances. And these happen to be the species that um, you don't find, say, growing in the UK. So here's our uh, ancestral climate reconstruction. Again, only looking at um, um, variables that show biogenetic conservancy. Here we've got temperature range. Um, so the reds and yellows are 
uh, large temperature range tolerance and the, the purples and uh, blues are low temperature range tolerance. Okay, and here we've got sort of, sort of clear biogenetic patterns where some groups are more tolerant and others are less. So this is a, a sort of a visualization of our uh, niche reconstruction. So this is the sort of combination of those three species plotted together on a map. Apologies, it doesn't show up very well here. Okay, um, and we can see that for this clade, this is the uh, areas that, that are predicted as present. Okay, and as with the um, Sundew example, we project our ancestral state reconstruction. It's not very visible, sorry. Um, for um, our reconstruction of the ancestor for this clade. And again, in turn, this clade and this clade. And although you can't make out the map very well, what you can see is a sort of narrowing of uh, uh, um, um, good climatic conditions for our ancestral species. But this is just projecting into the present day climate. So it's just a visualization to say, how our ancestral climate differs from our extent climate. So, if, if you like, we've got the opposite artifact of the diva style reconstruction, where we get a narrowing of our areas rather than a widening of our areas. Okay, but again, what we can do is we can project our ancestral cyclamen um, model into a paleoclimate reconstruction for the mid Miocene. Okay? And rather than say everywhere is suitable, what we have is some patchy areas. So here's a sort of grayscale where the, the black is highly suitable, the gray is reasonably suitable, the white is partially suitable. Okay? So here we've got a set of very patchy areas that are potentially suitable for our ancestral reconstruction. And again, I'm not claiming that this is. Um, uh, true in any way. Um, there's large uh, error margins on the paleoclimate, on the paleogeography, on uh, the ancestral state reconstruction, but it gives us a, a different view of our uh, um, um, ancestral areas. I think. And ideally what we would do is then go and look for fossils in a particular area or have some fossil evidence that would either validate or invalidate these models. Unfortunately, cyclamen no fossilized. Um, so what did we learn from this? Um, so there's phylogenetic conservancy for environmental parameters. So um, you know, some groups have adapted to certain climatic conditions and then diversified within those uh, conditions. Okay? Um, climate change may have played a role. Geography was really important. We can see there's lots of geographic barriers that um, are basically um, forming uh, barriers to gene flow to those species that would otherwise otherwise. Okay, um, speciation is largely monopatric. Um, and at least in cultivation, species have similar climate preferences. So our uh, last case study is Gastrolobium. Gastrolobium is a uh, genus of legumes. Uh, they are um, they diversified in Australia. Again, the main diversity is in the southwest Australia, the, the um, Mediterranean biome. Okay. Uh, they're um, endemic to Australia. They're insect pollinated. They occur in many different habitats. Okay, and they're quite poor dispersers. Their seed dispersers, uh, their dispersers uh, uh, they have quite large seeds and they're dispersed by mammals, I think. So again, we have a phylogeny for this group. Um, here's the gastrolobium. Here's some outfruits. Okay, and we dated this phylogeny using um, calibrations from um, other uh, legume groups. Again, gastrolobium no fossilized, so we don't have any fossil information. Okay? Um, but the, the, the main crown diversification 
occurred at around 8 million years ago, and this is shortly after the formation of the Mediterranean climate. So here we've got evidence for the appearance of our Mediterranean climate and then a diversification of, of, of this group. And again, we, we um, produced a lineage through time plot. This is a little bit more complicated. Um, here we've got our time axis, present day, eight million years ago, number of lineages here. Okay, the dark black line is our observation of lineages. Okay, and again, um, if, we, um, if we expect a sort of gradual accum accumulation of species using um, a sort of pure birth model, this is what this is. It's uh, what we would expect if we've just got the same number of species but having a gradual um, pure birth diversification at a steady state. The little um, open triangles are the error bars associated with the time axis of our observations and the open circles here are the um, error bars associated with our pure birth model. Okay. And actually, our observation pretty much mostly occurs within our uh, uh, um, er error bars of the pure birth model, and we can't reject the hypothesis that this is actually steady state lineage accumulation. Okay. So, no massive leap of diversity, just steady state gradual accumulation of more species. Okay. So the message here is that actually our um, niche modeling isn't particularly useful. Here's our, uh, we, we, we run niche models for all of our species, and this is projecting into the last relation maximum. This is a different scenario, but we get a Southwest Australia diversity hotspot. We then projected our ancestral state reconstruction to Southwest Australia, and we get Southwest Australia being the, the, um, the climatically suitable area. So what we've got is a climate that's suitable for these species and a steady state accumulation of species within the area. So that sort of suggests, well, okay, well, the climate has been uh, necessary component, but it doesn't seem to be driving anything because we've got a steady state accumulation. So is there any other environmental characteristics that we can look at that might help explain the large diversity of gastrolobium? Well, uh, the answer is yes. Here's uh, um, our phylogeny again, and here's a little checkerboard that um, shows the occurrence of each species in different habitats. So if we just look at this zoo, we've got wetland, mallee, heath, wood, shrub and forest. And here we've got soil type, clay, sand, loam, skeletal and gravel. And what you can see here is rather what you can't see. You can't see any phylogenetic pattern. If, you know, we might expect closely related species to have similar habitat preferences and similar soil preferences. But actually, that's not the case. And again, we can do formal tests on this to say, you know, are any of these characteristics showing phylogenetic conservancy? And the answer is, well, only two of them, the wetland and the skeletal. But these are actually very um, um, seldom, uh, uh, there are very few wetland species. Okay? So of our 11, um, habitat and soil characters, only two show any phylogenetic pattern. So this is potentially a, a, a driver for speciation in that um, closely related species have completely different soil preference, habitat preference. So we can like summarize our findings for cyclamen and gastrolobium, okay? We've got steady temperatures, but for gastrolobium we've got the climate being the, the background at which a steady state diversification happened, probably um, triggered by habitat and soil preferences. Okay? Whereas cyclamen, we've got um, geographic barriers being really um, important drivers for speciation. 
Okay, so um, in conclusion, the niche models can be useful in that they can um, allow us to address hypotheses of ancestral areas. Okay, they don't give us definitive answers, but they can provide some useful information. Okay, they can help us to understand um, uh, or in investigate certain aspects of the biology and um, the niche model in Castrolobium. Uh, uh, you know, let us say, okay, well, this is not telling us anything. We need to look for other characteristics. Okay. Um, importantly, you know, we, we, we keep, we keep in mind the biology rather than just sort of trying to produce lots of models. Um, I want to sort of conclude on saying that um, when I sort of present this work, and a lot of people roll their eyes, um, it's really a, an amalgamation of controversial techniques. Um, uh, many people dislike um, the, the niche modeling, but you should see, you should try to present uh, uh, and uh, temporally calibrate phylogeny to a bunch of playlists. It's not pleasant. Um, we've really got a, a models on top of models on top of models, and uh, actually having uh, any certainty of um, uh, validation is really difficult for this. Um, ideally, we could you know, find a, a, a group with a really good fossil record so that we could um, use fossil occurrences to validate or invalidate our ancestral areas. Um, and yes, I'd really like to find a group with a really good fossil record to try this out on. But at the moment, we don't have that. But we can use it to produce hypotheses that we can hopefully test later on. Uh, so I'd just like to thank Julie Hawkins and Rolanda Barsenas for the, um, uh, helping with the uh, work with Cactase, Alistair Cullen, for, uh, who supervised my PhD, and Paul Valdez for the sharing of the climate data. And one last thing, I'd like to thank uh, the organisers for inviting me here. Um, and doing such a great job at the uh, at the event. Thank you.